Here we go. Um, so my name is Mary Newton. I'm representing the Reading League Wisconsin this evening. And before we get started, I have just a few pieces of information for you. Uh, please keep your mics muted. Um, if you have questions, put them in the chat. And we do have 90 minutes tonight, so I'm sure there'll be plenty of time at the end for us to pull out a fair number of questions from the chat and give those to Jan. So uh, please do that. Um, just keep your mics muted because we have a lot of people online tonight. If you'd like a certificate of attendance, um, I will be posting near the end of the meeting a link in the chat for you to uh, go and request a certificate of attendance. Please submit that tonight because I'm planning to send all of those certificates out in one batch tomorrow. And if you don't see yours in your inbox, please check your spam folder or your junk folder because things often end up there, especially if you're using a school district email account. I will be posting your handouts in the chat shortly. Um, they will include a PDF of tonight's slides as well as some information on how to contact the chapters of the Reading League that are co-hosting tonight. I want to thank two of my fellow board members at the Reading League Wisconsin for helping organize this program, Amy McGovern and Jeannie Schopp. And I want to introduce you to our co-hosts for the evening. So we, I'm not sure if Illinois is on here yet. So um, Kellen, if you're here, can you unmute? Otherwise, I will go on to Rebecca because I see Rebecca from Michigan is online. Rebecca, can you unmute and just introduce yourself briefly? Hi, welcome, and we're so glad to be with you this evening. I'm Rebecca Miles from um, the Reading League Michigan. I'm the president and so thrilled to be here. Awesome. And Shonda from Ohio. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, I am Shonda Koblenz, and I'm the president here in the state of Ohio. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. I was just telling our presenter, this is what I'm speaking about in my university courses this week. So I'm hoping to learn some new things myself tonight. So welcome all of you. Thank you so much for giving your, your evening to learn more to help our students become better readers. Thank you, Shonda. Is anyone on here from our sister chapter in Indiana? Perhaps um, Melissa, someone? Um, I'm, my name is Michelle Howigi. Um, I'm a, a district lead from Indiana. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, so now we're going to um, get to what everybody's waiting for, and that is our presentation by Dr. Jan Hasbrook on fluency, a topic that she's well known for and that educators are always interested in. Dr. Hasbrook is a leading researcher, educational consultant, and author who works with schools both in the United States and internationally. She worked as a reading specialist and a coach for 15 years and then became a professor. Her research in reading fluency, academic assessment, and interventions, and instructional coaching has been widely published. She's the author or co-author of several books, curriculum materials, and assessment tools. Dr. Hasbrook continues to collaborate with researchers on projects related to reading assessment and intervention and enjoys volunteering at her grandson's K through eight school in Seattle. So Dr. Hasbrook, I'm gonna turn things over to you. All right, thanks Mary and Chandra and Rebecca and everybody attending here this evening after I know what for all of you has probably been a very full day already. So I'm, I appreciate uh, your making the time and giving me your presence for this evening and to all the many people who may have a chance to watch this um, later. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, hopefully restart <laughs> my, uh, let's see how we do this. My, we've all we've got the, PowerPoint all loaded up. So here we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about reading fluency tonight. And we're going to talk about it in a framework of comprehension. Uh, I think it's very important to continue to make that connection from the very beginning. So um, I'm glad you have copies of or have access at least to the copies of the PowerPoint handouts. Um, and I will tell you right now, that as a 
uh, adherent to the science of reading, that ever-changing, growing, vast body of information, um, my mind keeps shifting and changing just a little bit as I learn more. So there was one slide added here tonight that you don't have because last week I attended the recording of a webinar um, that influenced my thinking. Um, that's just the way it is. So, but uh, I can give you a link to that same webinar and would strongly recommend you attend it. Um, and the fact tonight uh, that we have just this, um, a relatively short period of time, um, it's, it's uh, uh, together. Uh, there are ways I would love to stay connected with people afterwards, since we're not all in the same room together. One way I'm finding is a terrific way to connect with colleagues around the world is through Twitter. Um, I had a wonderful interaction today with Dr. Pamela Snow, who's in Australia. Um, so it's just a really lovely community of people who remain uh, eager to learn more about this complex thing called <laughs> teaching children to read. So that's one way for us to stay connected. Um, well, this is not really connection, but I just wanted to let you know some of the ideas that I am uh, sharing with you tonight uh, come from this book. And I wanna give credit where credit is due because this is a co-authored book by my amazing uh, colleague, Dr. Deb Glazer. Um, she does so many things. Just most recently, she's written two different books on morphology. So I hope you know her name that way. But uh, we collaborated to write this book on reading fluency, which goes into much greater depth um, than we're going to be able to cover tonight. Uh, Deb and I also collaborated on a literacy brief um, for the International Literacy Association, um, again, covering some of the same ideas. This is a free resource. You can go to the ILA website and read about that. Some of you, well, many of you, uh, this is sponsored by the Reading League, so I assume many of you have access to the wonderful journal that they put out um, in 2020. Um, you may have noticed that they did this special issue on um, an update of the <clears throat> National Reading Panel report, because it's 20 years old now, um, and they did ask me to write the chapter on the updated information about reading fluency, so that's another way to get a little, go a little deeper after, after this evening. So, we're going to talk a lot of things. Uh, I already said that uh, comprehension is the is the focus of what we should talk about today, um, and and we can even joke about this idea that what what are we doing here? Spend spending an hour and a half or so talking about fluency because fluency is not important, um, uh, and we could joke about that in the same way we say phonics isn't important, phonemic awareness is not important. Those things aren't important by themselves. <laughs> Fluency has no value really in and of itself. Its value is it is essential for helping our students become and being able to comprehend and it plays a role in motivation that we will talk about. And because of that, we should think about um, and reflect about and teach and assess fluency as connected to comprehension. So I hope that's a clear message of my presentation tonight. Uh, my goal, and uh, if you attend, if you're lucky enough to attend workshops by Anita Archer, uh, you may have seen her use these goals for her workshops too, because I stole this directly from Anita. Um, I think a value of uh, attending workshops like this, trainings in person um, or, or online webinars, is sometimes we come and we spend most of the time just uh, affirming what we already knew. It's not always possible. There's not huge new understandings about fluency, um, but I think it's valuable to hear somebody um, affirm what I already know. Okay, I'm on the right track. Okay, I'm thinking correctly about this. So I hope some of that happens to you today. Um, this is a vast, complex thing that we're talking about. So it's possible that I might talk about some things that remind you of things you do know, but you hadn't thought about for a while. And then, of course, 
Um, we always hope to expand our knowledge, our understanding, our some resources perhaps. So that would be great if any or uh, all of those things happen to you tonight. Um, in our time together, I'm going to try to address these three things. If we're going to talk about reading fluency, we should define it. Uh, there are lots of, of uh, confusions uh, about assessing reading fluency. So I want to be sure that we're talking about that. And then, of course, the teaching or developing. How do we help our students become fluent readers? So um, makes sense to me to start with defining reading fluency. And we want to put fluency in the framework of the complexity of reading. In the book I wrote with Deb, we talked about reading as, as being a highly complex task that involves many interconnected and codependent linguistic processes. And that idea of codependency is really relevant here tonight. Codependent linguistic processes that draw upon a variety of separate skills. Uh, I love this diagram that comes from um, a, a scientific paper uh, discussing these authors' uh, attempt to model reading using a multivariate statistical analysis of reading. Um, and without, you know, I don't know how, what size screen you're looking at, but, uh, you don't need to really know what all the numbers are, or even all the words on there. It's simply an idea that uh, this is a modeling of what reading is using a statistical analysis, and it's complex. There are different values, different weights of contribution, and different levels of interaction, but it all works together ultimately to get us where we want to get with our students, which is reading comprehension. Uh, I know we're all grateful for this much <laughs> sort of neater and tidier, but also very accurate um, uh, modeling of the complexity of reading, a very, very familiar Scarborough's rope, where the notion of the value, the purpose of reading, reading comprehension, that target of our work is represented by that tightly woven rope and her definition as uh, of skilled reading, but the result is has to be that interaction between that complexity of language comprehension and the word recognition pieces so that we can get to that goal, the fluent execution and coordination of those two components. And I have heard, I heard uh, a while ago now, a couple of years ago, Dr. Scarborough being interviewed about this rope. And now 20 some years later, um, what would she change about the rope based on newer research? And she basically said not much. Uh, she kind of liked it. She, uh, the person who was interviewing her said, there's been one critique of her, of her rope though, is that it doesn't uh, include fluency as one of the skills that is necessary. And uh, I remember when I heard that, I thought, oh, that's not exactly right. Because in my mind, um, and Dr. Scarborough said that too, she said, oh yeah, fluency is there. It's not a skill. Um, so it's not one of the strands, but it is the outcome. It is the, it is the result of the um, coordination and the fluent execution and the automaticity of, of all of those component skills. So fluency is there. To me, it's the visual representation of that tightly woven rope that can lead, doesn't guarantee comprehension, uh, but it can um, lead to comprehension. And we do know when Deb and I wrote our book, we acknowledge that there's still a lot of questions about, about fluency. When we think about the definition, we can go back to the National Reading Panel, who talked about fluency as the ability to read text quickly, accurately, and with expression. And you'll see here in a bit that um, while I agree to a large part with th this attempt to define fluency, I have some uh, some quibbles with it, if you will. Um, and I think that one of the things we've gotten more sophisticated about is thinking about the development of fluency. And, you know, in so many ways, when we think about uh, becoming sophisticated in our thinking about 
anything about reading. Uh, so much of that comes from Mary Ann Wolf. Uh, my, my friend and colleague, some of you know, I'm one of the members of the the group called the very informal little group we call ourselves the Peaceniks, and and uh, Marianne Wolf is part of that, and she's influenced my thinking so much. But way back in two thousand and one, she and her colleague wrote about uh, how fluency develops in progressions. That when we say fluency, and this was a conversation I had today, um, not with with Pamela Snow, but with somebody else uh, about specifically about reading fluency, that we use that term fluency in our field and um, but what and what we usually really mean when we say fluency is we mean text reading fluency or passage fluency. because when we use the word fluency alone, we can be talking about letter and sounds and words. Um, and that's different than the fully complex, uh, that tightly woven rope is representing text reading fluency. But to get there, we have to have fluency at the letter level, the sound level, the letter, le letter pattern level, and the word level. And then fluency at the phrase and um, sentence and passage level starts to get much more complex because we have semantics and syntactic processes that that kick in. So all of that has to, uh, we have to be developing accuracy and then fluency or automaticity at each of those levels. And then we hope um, we can achieve for our students or help them achieve the fluent effortless reading of text. And the importance of that is comprehension. That's the reason we're talking about this tonight is because without the fluent, effortless reading of text, um, the brain is simply needing to attend to too many, um, too many of the uh, aspects of reading and they, it, it can't fully attend to comprehension. So in our book, Deb and I uh, define fluency and um, as, as reasonably accurate reading first at an appropriate rate with suitable expression. An earlier version of our book, we used the word prosody. And when we were doing this update of the book, we went back and forth. Should we use prosody? Should we use expression? We reached out to many different people. A lot of the experts in the field use those as synonymous. Um, uh, one of the experts we talked to said she thought of ex as expression as the larger umbrella. So, and it's the term that teachers are more um, generally used. So we use the term expression. Um, and that, should remind you of the definition from the National Reading Panel. They use basically these three elements, but they put rate first. They said fluency is reading quickly, um, and we don't for a, a reason that I'll, I'll share with you soon. But we also didn't stop there. Many definitions of fluency do, but we went ahead and added this um, the really the purpose of fluency. Uh, fluency does not equal comprehension. It doesn't guarantee comprehension. But if we put fluency on a shelf and just think about fluency as having some value by itself, we, we disconnect with its real purpose. So we want to say just even in its definition that we care about fluency because we hope um, that it will lead to accurate and deep comprehension. We have lots and lots of uh, research evidence that shows that that is true, um, uh, the comprehension aspect. The motivation is less supported by, um, by research. Motivation, for one thing, is very hard to study. But uh, you know, some things can't be studied very well. And until we have something that proves that fluency is not connected to motivation, um, uh, we get to use our clinical experience. And Deb and I, um, goodness knows, have <laughs> many, many, many decades of clinical experience of working with struggling readers. And we know <laughs> from our clinical experience that fluency is very connected to motivation in our 
many decades of teaching, we have yet to find a student who's a highly motivated reader who also struggles with fluency. So there's gotta be some kind of connection. But the essential elements are these, these three things. And then we want to talk about what are the standards for these things? How much accuracy? How much, um, uh, what is the appropriate rate? What about expression? So we talked about performance standards um, that are actually variable because they should vary. Reading is a very, is a very variable task. So when we talk about accuracy, rate, and expression, we use these terms, reasonably accurate, appropriate rate, and suitable expression. So. What do we mean by all of this when we're talking about reasonable accuracy? Well, it's very, very important that we get this right. So in order to do that, um, and this comes from our book, we do say a few F words um, with exclamation marks, but um, uh, for sensitive learners here, <laughs> don't worry, we're not gonna say anything offensive, I don't think at all, but just to emphasize the importance here of accuracy. So the first F is that word first. That goes back to the work of Wolf and Katzer Cohen um, and others who say in, in order to get good at anything, including reading, what has to happen first is you have to lay, uh, you have to become accurate. Um, and when we think about the importance of, or the, the, the role of fluency, it's Foremost, if you think about those three things, accuracy, rate, and expression of those three, if comprehension is the goal, which it should be, accuracy is the most important. Rate is not going to get you to comprehension. Prosody, we'll talk about prosody. Prosody has minimal contributions to um, comprehension. Accuracy is the enormous um, contributor to comprehension. So first, foremost, and forever, it's not just the thing we need to worry about at first. Accuracy, as long as we are readers, forever as readers, accuracy is, um, is key to the importance of fluency, the importance of comprehension, because because fluency, uh, because accuracy is the foundation of fluency. So those first, those, those Fs, First, foremost, and forever, accuracy is the foundation of fluency. So that's making the point about the importance of accuracy. But can we get some numbers? Uh, what do we mean specifically about reasonably accurate? And I want to emphasize here that I'm talking these numbers that I'm sharing that come from research are about independent reading because. Um, we could have a discussion about this, but uh, I think that the, for me, the research is clear when we look at systematic, explicit research, especially for struggling readers. When we have that opportunity to do direct, explicit instruction with students, accuracy should be 100%. Because anytime they make an error, we want to correct it. That's a teaching opportunity. Um, how we correct it, um, depends greatly on whether it's whole class or small group. It depends on the type of error, the age of the kids, all kinds of things. But in a teaching situation, accuracy should be 100% or as close to it as possible. When students are reading independently, researchers are have given us these guidelines, no less than 95%. Um, there is some research that say actually the bottom line is 98%. So I put that range because um, we're talking about human beings here and it's not, it's not, um, it's not definitive, but certainly it's not 100% in independent reading because we're talking about human beings here. We don't do things perfectly um, and we don't need to. We're talking about how accurate do we need to be to comprehend. Somewhere between 95 to 98% accuracy is necessary for comprehension. When we turn to looking at the youngest readers or emerging readers, um, what does the research say about accuracy? Well, we could hypothesize that maybe it should be a little lower because they're just beginning. Of course, they're going to make lots of mistakes and maybe that's okay for emerging readers. Or maybe it should be just 95 to 98 because that's the level of accuracy it should be. The research is quite clear for these emerging readers that when they're reading independently, it should be as high as we can 
help them do it. <laughs> you know, again, in instruction, it's 100%. Now they're off reading by themselves. For our beginning, re this and this is why we use decodable text. We do not want them to make mistakes. We do not want our young emerging readers before they have broken the code, before they have been launched as readers, before they have figured out what they're doing. We want them to read with this high level of accuracy as possible to, to lay that foundation for the orthographically mapped sight words, to build their confidence about reading, um, to make sure they're not guessing ever um, uh, uh, at words. So those are the guidelines from research. And we use the term reasonably though, because we read for different purposes. If we're re reading something um, high, high, high stakes, I was watching a new, um, show on Netflix, it's a, a medical show and they're showing a lot of uh, surgeons in practice and they have checklists. The surgeons and the surgical nurses have checklists to make sure these highly, highly brilliant experienced people are still doing everything by a checklist because they want to be 100%. And without a checklist, it's gonna be very hard to be 100% because we're human beings. Um, so when we're doing something super high stakes, 100% is reasonable. Um, when we're reading for pleasure, we're reading for enjoyment, we're skimming and scanning, it's perfectly reasonable um, to be much less accurate. But most of the time, we want to be in that neighborhood of 95 to 98% accuracy for comprehension. How about rate? Um, well, of course, it must be that we should teach our students to read as fast as possible. I see a lot of that going on in classrooms, uh, but that's not true. You know that's not true. Um, and here's some good guidance for that that comes from the brilliant mind of uh, Steve Stahl and his colleague, Melanie Kuhn. They did a lot of work together before Steve passed away. But in 2002, they made this brilliant statement, fluent reading should sound like speech. Um, and that, ladies and gentlemen, um, should make us stop and ponder why should fluent reading sound like speech? And I'll give you a hint. The answer is because of comprehension. Our brains, we're learning a lot about this, having lots of discussions about this these days, is that our brains, most of our brains, nearly 100% of human brains are born with the biological support for speech. Um, that is how we have evolved all these millennia to still be alive. It's because our ancestors way back when figured out how to talk to each other. Um, and we've been talking to each other in some form for for a long, long time, long enough for our brains to develop the innate biologically supported capability of speech. Print is a new invention. We have not yet developed uh, biological support for print. But when we're reading, what we're doing is translating print, uh, a graphic representation of speech back into speech. The more we can mirror speech, the more, the more readily, more easily our brains will make sense of it. If, and we're talking about rate here specifically. So if information comes into our brain too quickly, significantly above the rate of speech, we cannot understand it. Our brains are not wired that way. If information comes in too slowly, our brains can't make sense of it. We're wired to have a certain rate of input to comprehend it. So what a brilliant statement. Yes, fluent reading should sound like speech. But again, it's helpful to have some numbers for that. And the numbers that a lot of people use come from the assessment of oral reading fluency, where we have our students read unpracticed text for about 60 seconds. Um, when we're screening students, we use grade level text. For other purposes, we can use text um, lower or higher than grade level. Um, and I know you're all familiar with one or more of these commercially available um, assessments. Each one of them have norms that say, here are the levels that a student should 
B reading if they take the Dibbles assessment in the winter of third grade, for instance, or Easy CBM in the fall of fifth grade, or Ames Web in the spring of uh, fourth grade, whatever it is, they've established their own norms. Um, but way back in the olden days, uh, before there were commercially available uh, ways to give ORF, uh, Jerry Tyndall and I um, thought that the ORF assessment, assessing words correct per minute, was a wonderful tool, but early on there were no norms. Uh, the assessment had been invented, but there, there were no norms. So uh, back in the late 80s, and we actually published our first study in 1992, we established some norms for oral reading fluency. We did a second, much bigger study in 2006. Um, and then uh, just a few years ago, we updated uh, this with the, <clears throat> the most recent chart that I included in the handouts tonight, and it's readily available. Um, and from these charts that we've compiled, which can be used for other texts, I get the, this question nearly probably at least once a week where somebody says, I, we're using AmesWeb, or we're using Dibbles, or we're using EasyCBM, or we're using FastBridge or something, um, and should we use their norms or your norms? Uh, and the answer is, if you're using, for purposes of screening, uh, benchmark, uh, uh, progress monitoring, those kinds of things, and you're using a particular program, you should use their norms. But you may want to assess students um, outside those assessments, just having your students read a fourth grade social studies book or a, 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 a group a, novel that you think or a chapter book that's about a third grade level, you can use our norms for those kinds of decisions. And But what is the number you're looking for here? So you can see that these norms go from the 10th percentile up to the 90th percentile, three times a year, lots of numbers there. What are the numbers you should be using? Well, we have long suggested um, that the percentile that we should be aiming for is a, actually a range, somewhere between the 50th and the 75th percentile. And we based our recommendations for many years basically just on what we observed in the classroom, but we've been validated on this by a recent study that these folks did looking at uh, the 2018 NAEP scores. So the NAEP, as you know, is a study of essentially comprehension. It's a multiple choice assessment where kids are um, given a lot of, of questions to answer, and then they're scored um, uh, in, and categorized in their score. So the students who do the best on the NAEP are considered advanced. Those who do very well, um, or at least at or above grade level are proficient. If they're just hovering around grade level basic, and then we have categorizations of below basic. What they did, these uh, White and colleagues did in this study, is they went back and um, looked at the oral reading fluency scores of students who, in each of these categories, and uh, their findings were pretty amazing. So when you, so these were fourth graders, end of fourth grade. Um, so the end of the year, uh, fourth grade norms on the Hasbrook and Tyndall, the most recent study, the 75th percentile is 160. And look <laughs> at uh, the score that White et al. came up. It's not 163, it's not 157, it's exactly the 75th percentile. For the students, uh, we, we have calculated 50th percentile at 133 words correct per minute. And we've always said at the 50th percentile particularly, you wanna take that number and add 10 and subtract 10. It's a range even around the 50th percentile. So if you add 10 and subtract 10, that takes you almost exactly to the number of the students at the proficient and basic level and those students who are struggling with fluency are below uh, below basic. So this is now some very strong compelling evidence to suggest that 
there really is no value of pushing kids above the 75th percentile based on our research. Yeah, there are kids who read faster than that, uh, but it's not going to get them anything. And that term, it can be detrimental. Y you all work. I know you have seen those children who read so fast that at the end of their reading, they really don't know what they've read. If the point of reading is comprehension, uh, I th and I think it is, um, the 75th percentile is, is just fine. Um, but it is the 50th percentile is really, really important. So kids who fall below the 50th percentile are in trouble. They're in trouble with comprehension. They're in trouble with motivation. So this is the little takeaway with this. The research su suggests pretty strongly in my mind that the 75th percentile is sufficient for optimizing comprehension, whereas the 50th percentile is necessary for basic accurate comprehension. Appropriate rate, not as fast as possible. Let's, uh, uh, the rate of speech is probably appropriate most of the time, a little bit faster sometimes if we're skimming and scanning. Maybe, honestly, we should slow down if we're reading, again, something that's high stakes or very complex, appropriately slow down. Uh, appropriately speed up if we're reading for uh, fun and enjoyment. Um, but most of the time we want to read at a rate that's somewhere around, uh, in general, for most of us, that would be around 150 words correct per minute. For children who are developing still in school, we can use the Hasbrook and Tyndall norms. What about expression? The pitch, tone, emphasis, rhythm, phrasing of speech. Uh, well, Stalin Kloon in Kuhn said it, fluent reading should sound like speech. Uh, what we do know about suitable expression is that typically we want uh, reading, and we can only judge that, of course, if students are reading aloud, we want it to mirror spoken language um, and convey meaning. That would be suitable. Um, but the research, those researchers who have really taken a, a deep look at fluency um, say that, or a deep look at this aspect of fluency, prosody or comprehension, say that different from accuracy and different from rate, this aspect of fluency is less of a contributor to comprehension as it is an outcome of comprehension. And we can just take one aspect of prosody um, uh, emphasis and see how that is true. So here's a sentence repeated uh, five different times with just a little bit of emphasis, which changes the entire meaning of the sentence. Robert borrowed my new bicycle. It was Robert, not Raymond. Robert borrowed my new bicycle. He didn't steal it. Robert borrowed my new bicycle, not yours. Borrowed, Robert borrowed my new bicycle, not my old one. But Robert borrowed my new bicycle, not my new book. How do you know which word to emphasize unless you know what the meaning of the of the sentence is. Um, and there's actually quite a bit of research that has underscored that. So we don't spend as much time, I don't spend as much time talking about expression because my interest is comprehension. So I, I think that we should not ignore it. And certainly we want to early, early, early on get our students to pay attention to periods and commas and question marks and those kinds of things. And we want to model good expression for them. But in terms of dividing up our precious instructional time, um, there's just not the payoff until we've laid that foundation for fluent reading. It's kind of the icing on the cake or the cherry on top. It's not irrelevant um, at all but it's not, uh, it plays a very different role in fluency. So the components that we've talked about of passage fluency or text fluency, accuracy, rate, and expression, um, we do refer to those as components. But the reason that we could spend a lot more time talking about uh, a fluency is, be, is it is complex and it's complex because there's also all this other stuff going on. In order to be fluent, you have to have those word decoding skills. You have to have text decoding skills. You have to have comprehension skills. Fluency contributes to comprehension 
And fluency is an outcome of comprehension. It has that duality, that, that interconnectedness, that, uh, that word from the beginning of uh, the various facets of, of reading um, interact and are codependent. Comprehension and fluency are interactive and codependent. It's very complex. So we can scoot quickly over this one. What is the role of reading fluency? Because I've emphasized it enough. The accuracy is really important because it doesn't take very much inaccuracy for, flu for comprehension to be impaired. Um, rate uh, is going to be imp uh, place a role because comprehension is going to be limited if we're either too slow, inefficient, laborious, or reading too fast. Um, and we do know that lack of fluency uh, does lack motivation. And in part, uh, what that results in, and very unfortunately, is that our students who lack motivation just read less. Uh, and if they read less, we know that one of the effects of that is a smaller vocabulary. And one of the effects of that is limited comprehension. And then it becomes self-perpetuating. So uh, here's the takeaway, the role of reading fluency, comprehension, 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 and a little bit of motivation. So let's spend some time on everybody's favorite topic, uh, assessment data, yay. Um, so uh, yeah, maybe not everybody's favorite, but it's important to talk about because when we're thinking about what fluency is and zeroing in on those two major components of accuracy and rate, it leads us to thinking about words correct accuracy per minute rate. And that ORF assessment that I mentioned before, the Dibbles, the Ames Web, the Easy CBM, FastBridge, all of those kinds of things, they're widely used they should be widely used. Everybody who teaches reading at every level should know what the ORF is um, and how to administer it. But as big a fan I am as I am about the ORF assessment, I know that it's often misused and misunderstood. So I wanna take a little bit of our time to talk about um, four of the most common confusions that I've noticed about people using that little one minute assessment of oral reading fluency. So the first confusion um, is this. People somehow, please understand I'm being very sarcastic right now, but people somehow believe that an assessment called oral reading fluency measures fluency. How in the world could they draw that conclusion? Um, uh, well, they draw that conclusion, obviously, because it says it measures fluency, but it doesn't. There's wide agreement now uh, among assessment researchers, and I know many of them, that way back when, uh, when oral reading fluency assessments were invented, and they were invented in the mid 80s, they have not been around forever, but mid 80s, I know for some of you that does feel like forever, but it, that's not that long ago, um, they were misnamed. Uh, one of the, or three of the people who talk about that are these uh, folks, uh, Michelle Hosp and John Hosp and Ken Howell, who wrote this book called The ABCs of CBM. And uh, they write in their second edition that it, this, this wonderful assessment, we all agree it's a wonderful assessment, should not have been named oral reading fluency. They said perhaps uh, we should be calling it oral passage reading. Um, uh, I know at least one person has suggested maybe it should have been called the raft, the reading aloud from text, uh, something like that. Uh, we do know it doesn't really measure fluency because it doesn't measure, uh, um, it doesn't matter prosody or expression, which is a component of fluency. It only measures accuracy and rate, which is the heart of fluency. Uh, but Accuracy and rate alone, and this was a con this was that conversation I was having with somebody today about fluency. Accuracy and rate is really what we mean by automaticity. Automaticity is a synonym for accuracy and rate. When we think of fluency, we can think of pa or passage reading fluency. 
I, we could say a passage reading fluency is automaticity plus prosody or automaticity plus expression. Automaticity is a synonym for the combination of accuracy or rate. That's what uh, Marianne Wolf and her colleague was talking about. We need readers need to become automatic at the letter level, the sound level, the word level, the phrase level. And that means accuracy first with rate. So that's what ORF is, is really measuring. When we're wanting to truly measure fluency, passage reading fluency, that complex construct, you really do need more than 60 seconds. You need to be sure you're looking at all three components, including expression and all those background issues, the mechanics as necessary. So uh, it would be really helpful if we stop thinking about ORF as a measure of fluency um, and, and think of it as a measure of automaticity, which is really, really, really important. So, the second most common confusion, um, and we've kind of addressed this already, is that a lot of people just want the highest words correct per minute score as possible. They push their kids, you're up, up at 180, see if you can get to 200. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, appropriate rate, we can go back to stall and cune. It should sound like speech. The research that I shared with you, the 75th percentile is sufficient for optimizing comprehension. And that's what we care about. We don't care about speed. <laughs> we care about comprehension. Um, so we need that range of the 75th, but minimum the 50th. So a higher score, no, is not better. So the third most common confusion is this one. People who agree with me that the real thing that we should be thinking about and talking about and caring about is comprehension. I absolutely agree. But some people are saying we should not be assessing uh, words correct per minute. What we should really be measuring is comprehension. And to that, I say, well, yeah, sure, but <laughs> of course, comprehension is the most important thing. The problem is measuring comprehension. It is very, very complex to measure. Um, we have figured out, our profession has figured out how to measure comprehension, but it takes a long time. School psychologists can measure comprehension in a way that is very accurate, and it takes, um, minimum of an hour, very minimum, um, oftentimes two or three hours to get a good full assessment of comprehension. Reading specialists, diagnosticians, a lot of people can measure comprehension, but you certainly can't do it in 60 seconds. Um, and you can't even do it in uh, a half hour. Um, and this is the slide that is not in your handouts today. Um, just recently in the last week or so, uh, I took time to, uh, to go look at the um, uh, wonderful free resources. The AIM Institute has an annual uh, institute for learning and research, and they have recorded these amazing, I've only listened to one so far, but I know they're all gonna be amazing, um, these hour or so uh, lectures or presentations that were done um, at their institute on March 11th. And I finally got around, I bookmarked and wanted to listen to uh, uh, Hugh Katz talking about reading comprehension. And I'm very, very glad I did and I would highly recommend it to you. He says that comprehension performance cannot be reduced to a single score because it's not a single thing. So much brilliance in his uh, presentation. Every individual has a whole range of comprehension abilities that depends both on their innate abilities, as well as what they're reading and what the purpose of reading is. It's so complex. So he told us all, stop measuring comprehension as if it is a single thing. It isn't. Um, and to do this little, you know, five item assessment and to say this child has good comprehension or bad comprehension. No, no, no. So what do we assess instead in the classroom? We cannot take two or three hours to assess each child's comprehension. So he said, assess words read accurately and fluently, assess their language, 
do some think alouds, have a child read and talk to you about what they're reading and uh, do curriculum based assessments of what has been taught. That's the way to understand if they are comprehending. What are you teaching them? Did they learn it? Can they talk about it? Can they answer questions about what you're teaching specifically? But look at the first thing on his list. Assess words read accurately and fluently. Very interesting. That sort of reminds me of the ORF, words correct, correct per minute. And I know Dr. Katz is familiar with this body of research because ORF has been studied for, it's really closer to 40 years now at this time, as a correlate of reading comprehension. That's why we care about ORF, not because it tells us about fluency, it's because it gives us a peek into our students' comprehension. Dr. Katz would agree. This study uh, just is such a brilliantly done study um, way back in 2001, where these researchers uh, were wanting to look at different ways that we could actually, we as classroom teachers and reading specialists, could actually get an accurate peak at our students' comprehension. So the first thing they did was to give these students those multifaceted, multidimensional, deep, expansive measures of comprehension. They gave them one of those two to three hour assessments and um, had a, a good idea of what these kids score was. So they had a single score and said, this is, we're gonna call this their comprehension. Then they had uh, administered these other assessments. They had the students each read a passage and do a retell. And then they took their true comprehension score and their retail score and correlated it as a statistical analysis to see how close these things are. And in this study, they got a, a coefficient, a validity coefficient of, of 0.70. These, these two things correlated quite well. Their true comprehension was very close to their retail, um, which should make sense to, to all of us that the ability to read text and tell what you learned from the text is pretty good sense of comprehension. They had the students do a close, which they have to literally guess words that are missing. Um, this correlated very similarly, 0.72, a strong correlation. They had the students read a passage and answer multiple choice questions. In this case, they got an extraordinarily high uh, validity coefficient, a correlation of 0.82, um, which is really good news because this is one way that we can efficiently check if kids are understanding things. Uh, we can give this uh, multiple choice test to a thousand kids all at the same time. It's very efficient um, and quite effective in determining um, if they are paying attention or learning, um, understanding what they read. And then um, they said, you know, well, let's just do an ORF assessment. Let's give these kids uh, 60 seconds to read unpracticed grade level text um, and see how well that correlates with their true comprehension score. And in this case, they got um, an, a nearly unbelievable score of 0.91. So a validity coefficient can get no higher than 0.99. That's as high as you can get. So 0.91 is truly extraordinary. And I have to be honest, I mean, I, I don't want to misrepresent that ORF doesn't always predict comprehension at a 0.91. In this study, it did. And over the last 40 years, we have found that it does predict comprehension or correlate with comprehension in the range of 0.7 to 0.9. So it is a very strong, it's why Dr. Katz said this is you know, do an assessment of, of uh, the rate and accuracy of word reading. That it, it is, um, it doesn't tell you that they're comprehending, but it tells you that they can, or if their score is very low, that they're going to have trouble with comprehension. And studies like this have been replicated uh, with much larger um, studies and recent studies that uh, ORF best predicted in first grade, ORF best predicted uh, third grade comprehension over many other assessments um, in, in uh, these this cohort of 12,000 students in uh, second and third grade 
the fall ORF score the best job. So people are continuing to study ORF because it is such a good, powerful uh, assessment. Um, and uh, yeah, and comprehension is what we should be concerned about, but it's really hard to measure. Um, the fourth most common, and there are others, but I'm gonna stop with this one, that students who have a low words correct per minute score need a fluency intervention. Um, and my response to this one, so you do, you give them an ORF and they're well below benchmark, do they need a fluency intervention? Um, my answer to that is maybe. When we give a fluency assessment and they're not at that tightly woven rope. So if this were uh, the representation of a fifth grader, who when we give this fifth grader, fifth grade text, the student cannot read it fluently. They're not at benchmark on an ORF. Do they need a fluency intervention? Is there trouble with fluency? Well, we can pretty definitively say, yes, they are struggling with fluency, but if we just target fluency, meaning accuracy, rate, and expression, we need to really, if we're going to be more sophisticated, we should go back and look at the underlying causes of the problems with accuracy, rate, and uh, expression. It could be a language-based issue. We need to take uh, to look into that. As Dr. Katz said too, how do we measure comprehension? Well, one of the things we need to do is look at their language. Why are they having difficulty uh, with accuracy? It may be any combination of phonological awareness or decoding or, or sight word recognition. So making sure that we're not just pushing kids to read faster and faster, with an intervention, um, making sure we're paying attention to the cause. We should, if we're going to use ORF, I think we should use ORF. We should be thinking of it as a thermometer. Um, there's a lot of similarity between thermometers and ORF assessments. Uh, they've both been around long enough to have proven their reliability and validity. Reliability means you get a consistent trustworthy result. And you know, uh, we, we trust the result of a thermometer. If you have uh, a, a child that's sick and you take their temperature 10 minutes later, um, the temperature is probably going to be about the same. It's very consistent. And uh, both thermometers and ORF um, have utility. That validity means a lot of different things, but one use of validity or one interpretation of validity is it gives you something useful. You don't just get a score. 87, 23, 149, um, it has some use or value to it and both ORF and thermometers do. Um, they're both used very quickly. I mean, it used to be, you know, an ORF takes a minute and compared to many other assessments, that's pretty darn quick. Uh, thermometer takes instance, uh, very instant now. Um, and you may not have thought about this before, but a thermometer gives you a score that you compare to a benchmark. Uh, unlike uh, words correct per minute, where we have to have a big chart and we have to look three times a year, different numbers for different grade levels, from birth to death, the benchmark for body temperature is the same. It's somewhere around, uh, it's, an, it's a range, uh, but it's somewhere around 98.6. Um, that's what we're looking for. Um, so they're similar that way. You get a score and you compare it to a benchmark. And here's another way that ORF is similar to a thermometer. Both of them are not diagnostic. They provide an important piece of the puzzle to answer what's going on. Um, is, this, is this person sick or not? They have a fever. Is this student struggling with reading? Oh, they're below benchmark. That's an important piece of information, but the fever doesn't tell you why they have a fever. The temperature doesn't tell you why they have a fever. The being below benchmark doesn't tell you why they're below benchmark, but it tells you they essentially have an academic fever. If they're below benchmark, they might have a mild fever or a severe fever, um, but it doesn't tell you why. We have to do um, physicians, if they have a patient with 104 fever, they have a lot of diagnostic work to do to figure out uh, why. Uh, the fever is 104. For us, 
to assess or further diagnose, uh, we need to have a student read a passage or maybe several passages and certainly for more than 60 seconds. What we're looking for is their ability to read uh, at minimum and practice grade level text with that level of sufficient accuracy that we talked about before at an appropriate rate, minimum 50th percentile on Hasbrook and Tyndall norms with suitable expression. Um, and we haven't talked really about assessing expression today, but the way it's done is through rubrics and checklists. Uh, we don't yet, there are people working on it, voice recognition assessments of prosody or expression, but for now, we listen to a student read and then we categorize um, it, uh, their, their um, prosody uh, or expression on, on various scales. And if we're really wanting to know true fluency, we're going to check for understanding too. So unlike those benchmark where we just do a words correct per minute, a true assessment of fluency um, needs to be a little bit more extensive. All right, I'm going to jump right into the last piece of fluency instruction um, so that we do have at least a few minutes for questions. Um, so I'm gonna quote a few people here when we're talking about fluency instruction. This is a reminder that um, that aspect of automaticity adding rate to the equation of our instruction should only happen after students become accurate readers. So this is going back to that notion of Wolf and Katzer Cohen, um, that what Deb and I talked about is the foundation of fluency is accuracy. Accuracy first, first, foremost, and forever. Um, and then we start to build rate on top of accuracy. And we, when we're talking about rate on top of accuracy, we're talking about automaticity. So that comes after accuracy is established. Non-automatic readers should not be encouraged to read faster and faster. So we've known this for a while. But when we're looking at fluency instruction particularly, um, I love the recommendations of Roxanne Hudson and Holly Lane and colleagues, uh, rather poetic in my mind, their recommendations saying this, the growth of reading fluency in all its multifaceted glory is the outcome of many different kinds of instruction, many different kinds of instruction. And what they're meaning is that in order to become fluent, you have to pay attention to all this stuff. It's not that you have to teach different kids in different ways. It's that you have to teach a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, you have to teach language and all the aspects of language. You need to teach word recognition. Um, so it is multifaceted in all its multifaceted glory. The instruction has to be multifaceted. And they remind us that then it has to be coupled with large amounts of carefully orchestrated reading practice. So you need both instruction and practice. Um, and the practice is this. The practice results, we hope, um, if you've done a good job in laying the foundation of the components, then the, uh, then the practice is the weaving together. We do that by reading words. We do that by reading phrases and sentences and text with lots of rehearsal and lots of practice and lots of feedback. Um, that's what the practice looks like so that Hopefully, ultimately, we get to that skilled, fluent reading um, that continues for life. Um, so thinking about those two things, and they're very different. I could do a whole two-day workshop on the difference between instruction and practice and what uh, they look like. But for now, we're going to talk about instruction actually very in a very simple way. Um, and this comes from the book that Deb and I wrote. And this idea actually was Deb's. If you know her work, um, you will recognize this because she's so darn clever. Uh, when we were writing our piece in the book about instruction, she said, let's come up with a mnemonic about instruction. Let's say that all fluency instruction 
from the beginning of early reading all the way through, if we're, te if we're teaching fluency, um, let's make sure that all lessons adhere to AAA. And if you think deeply, and I know it's a, been a long day, <laughs> I've been talking for a long time, but I bet you could figure out what the first A in triple A is, if you really think about it. Um, first, foremost, and forever, accuracy, all fluency level, all fluency instruction needs to address accuracy at the sound level, the letter level, the word level, the phrase level. And then we move to the second A, automaticity. And the third A is connect it all to meeting as soon as we possibly can. We can't do a lot of, with meaning at the letter level and the sound level. Um, although I watched a little two-year-old today, almost two-year-old, starting to who's starting to recognize letters, uh, he looked at an L on a sign. We were at a park this morning together and he pointed to the L and said, Lulu, which is his dog's name. And he saw a B on the sign, a capital B, and he said, Bubba which is what he calls his father. So we can start connecting meaning even at the letter level. But once we certainly get to the word level, we want to be sure that we're helping our children think about the meaning of the words. And certainly when we get to the phrases and the sentences, it's part of the instruction. Stop. You read it. You read it accurately. Now see if you can read it a little bit faster. See if you can read it with expression. Now let's talk about what it means. That doesn't happen way down once we're reading um, uh, chapter books. It starts at uh, perhaps even at the letter level <laughs> and certainly at the word level. But what about practice? Um, different from instruction, we're weaving together all those component pieces. Um, in a, the, I think this comes from the, uh, the article I wrote in the Reading League Journal. For students with established foundational skills, uh, I read about, talked about silent reading. Silent reading can and does play an important role in improving and, and strengthening reading. There is a role for silent reading, but only, really only for those students with the established foundational skills. If a student is still struggling with reading, we should think more about different ways to uh, practice with more active engagement. In the real world, most of us have opportunities to teach kids in the whole class, all of our students all together. So we've got tier one, tier two, and tier three kids sitting in front of us. For our children, if we've organized our classrooms well, we do have also opportunity to provide uh, differentiated explicit instruction uh, based on need to our students who need that. So first let's, so let's talk about fluency practice um, in both of those situations for all of our students in a classroom. Um, a lot of teachers are still relying on round robin as, <clears throat> excuse me, as a way to think about building fluency for students. But um, we all know, we don't even have to spend any time talking about it. R Round Robin has all kinds of, of disadvantages. And there's, uh, we should just toss it out because there's so many things that we can do that are actually much better. Um, and most of, I think, the, some of the best ideas uh, for this come from Anita Archer and Charles Hughes and that wonderful book, Explicit Instruction, where they talk about Choral reading, let's all the kids read out loud together. You've got some kids who are way above grade level. You kids have some kids who can barely read the text. Let's just all read it out loud together rather than painfully going around the room and embarrassing some kids and frustrating everybody. Close reading is an alternative to choral reading. Close reading, everybody's reading silently out of the same text while the teacher reads aloud, but everybody's following along and every once in a while the teacher stops. And as soon as the teacher stops, all the students say the word. Um, so that's what close reading is like. It takes a little bit of practice to do it well, um, but paired with choral reading, it's very highly engaging, um, can provide some practice for our students who need that. Augmented silent reading, they have some great recommendations in their book for how to uh, avoid what they call fake 
silent reading, which we have all know exists, um, ways to set up silent reading so it is beneficial for all students. Um, and they also talk about structured partner reading, which I want to talk about a little bit because that's what Hudson et al. are talking about when they talked about practice can include um, highly orchestrated practice. That is the beneficial practice, not just sending kids off to go practice on your own, but highly orchestrated. So one way to orchestrate practice is to structure, to use structured partner reading. Um, and one of the structures in partner reading that makes it more effective is to is be very thoughtful, very purposeful about how you're pairing your students. You do not want your highest student and your lowest student reading together. And not all students are going to benefit from partner reading. So we could consider taking some of the lowest students into a, uh, a group where we could provide more direct uh, explicit instruction. So in a, a quick example of this, um, this is a list of actual names in a classroom, a fourth grade classroom that I worked with a few years ago. Um, 24 kids in this fourth grade classroom. What I did, the reason these kids are ordered in this number is I asked the teacher to just take out a piece of paper and write down her kids from her top readers or middle readers to her low readers. And she did that. You could do this based on score reading scores if you had them, but it was just off the top of your head. Who are your high readers, your middle readers, your low readers? So she did that. And then the first thing I said is, um, uh, look at the bottom of your list. Is there a child or two or eight students who are so much lower than the other students that um, maybe they shouldn't be asked to do partner reading, that it wouldn't be fair to them, it wouldn't be fair to their partner? Um, and she instantly identified these four kids, Quan, Kaisha, Francisco, and Angelica. She said that they're not ready for partner reading. Okay, we'll take them out of the equation. Um, and then nicely, neatly, this left an equal amount of kids. So what she did is take her list and now divide it in half. So she's pairing Ebony, who she considered her best reader, with Michael, number 11, who's a, a good middle average reader, uh, and but not so different. So he's lower than Ebony in her estimation, but not so much lower that Ebony's going to be frustrated and Michael's going to be embarrassed. Um, number 10, Miguel, a good solid average reader, is paired with Ashley, who's not as strong a reader, uh, but not so different than Miguel that Again, Miguel is going to be frustrated. Ashley is going to be embarrassed. These kids can work. And then, of course, as soon as you make the list, you have to look over because this is a real world. Can these kids actually work with each other? Um, um, and I do remember it was a funny story. This was spring, fourth grade. She looked at number nine, Orlando and Sarah Jane and said, oh, no, 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 those kids can't work together because um, they just broke up. They just broke up from a you know, a fourth grade love affair or whatever. So she mixed these kids up a little bit. And of course, you don't keep them paired as partners for the whole year. You mix them up for all kinds of ways. But this is just an idea for how to get started. And while these kids are doing their structured partner reading, she's working um, in a small group with even if it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes, it can make a big difference. Um, another way to structure partner reading is uh, using uh, the ideas that came from Gail Adams, who created a commercial product that I think is wonderful. You can go buy a program called The Six Minute Solution. Um, but the basic structure is just fantastic. And you can use it with your own materials in your classroom. You start by getting some materials that you want the kids to read. You select partners, however you want to. You can use the idea I suggested. And then you spend some time teaching this, uh, this practice. You teach them and you practice over and over because that's where the benefit comes in. The kids know how to do this. And once you've done all that, you have your materials and you practice, then you can get some wonderful practice out of literally six minutes. Um, the first time I ever saw this was in a second grade classroom. Um, and I walked in and the teacher, we were chatting and she said, would you like to see six minute solution? And I said, oh yeah, sure. The kids were doing math, I think. And she just, she didn't say anything. She just 
picked up a little bell on her desk and rang it. Ding, 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 ding. And that signaled that it was minute one. The kids put their math down. They all scattered around the room. Uh, they were getting their materials and getting ready. They scattered around the room and then they all went and sat and they're all around the room. There were all these partners. That took one minute. She rang the bell again. She didn't say anything. She rang the bell again. All of a sudden, one child was reading out loud and the other child was listening and marking. A minute, she rang the, whoop, rang the bell again. Um, I heard the kids talking to each other. Um, and then she rang the bell again. And the other kids started reading aloud for a minute. Um, and then she rang the bell again and they, they were talking to each other. And she rang the bell again and they all scattered. And then they were back in their desk in six minutes. I couldn't believe it. Now, I loved it. I think it's fabulous. Think if you're you're getting ready, it's end of the day, everybody's tired, the kids are kind of tired um, and you just want to get everybody actively engaged. If you had this in your, in your repertoire, and the kids knew how to do this, what a wonderful way to spend six minutes. Do know though, I've heard people say that their fluency intervention is six minute solution. Mm-mm. Mm -mm -mm. Think about how much each child is reading. <laughs> They're reading for one minute. That's a good assessment. It's, it's, it's a good practice if you do it you know, once in a while, but it's, it's a little bit of practice. It, it's not anywhere near an inter intervention. So those are some of the things you could do for the whole class. Um, there are many things, um, and again, this could be a whole nother workshop of interventions um, of what we could do for fluency. But of course, we have to address all the underlying issues. And of course, we should pay anything should, uh, that we use for intervention should have the triple A aspect of it. So one of the things I'm going to recommend to you is a three-part intervention that I have adopted from the folks who have, um, again, another commercial product, the Read Naturally Company has a, a number of different fluency products that I think are excellent, um, but interwoven, they're, they're all based on this basic three-part model, just like the six-minute solution has its structure. Read Naturally does too. And the first step in the three-part intervention is accuracy. Um, you work on accuracy first, then students work on rate, um, and they are held accountable for understanding what they've read. The, the procedure has some processes for setting goals, the kids graph for motivation. Um, it's all detailed um, in a placement manual that they have, and you can get their placement manual for free online, and it walks you through how to basically do the process of the read naturally strategy. Uh, the students read first, they build their accuracy by reading along with a model, which could be a recording, um, or it could be a skillful reader. Then they do the building the automaticity or rate by doing repeated reading. And um, then they are monitored um, to make sure that they are truly fluent, including a demonstration of accessing uh, meaning. So way back when, uh, almost an hour and a half ago, I suggested that uh, I was going to talk about fluency as being important only to support comprehension and motivated reader reading. I hope that that was a key takeaway for you, that all aspects of fluency should be connected to comprehension, both in the way we assess and in the way we teach. My goal was that um, you were affirmed in some of the things that you already know about comprehension or about fluency, maybe comprehension, remind you of some of the things that maybe you knew but hadn't thought about for a while. And maybe, um, maybe, maybe you, some of your understanding or thinking or resources were expanded a bit. Um, I do very, very sincerely thank you for attending um, and listening to this webinar, either live tonight or later in the recording. And thank you from the bottom of my heart for the work that you do and the care that you have in the work that you do for teaching children to read. Um, let's connect on Twitter. That would, that would be great. So I'll stop sharing and um, 
maybe our organizers have a few questions for me tonight. You're still muted, Mary. I think you're talking, but you're muted. I think she's muted. So I'll start us off with a question. Okay. Okay, so one question, and these are really two different authors, so I'm going to kind of combine them into one. So uh, um, some of our participants noticed that the fluency chart is for first grade through sixth grade. Yes. We have one person who teaches kindergarten, curious how we assess fluency, what that kind of looks like. Is there a kindergarten one in the works? And then we have a couple of middle school friends who are working with seventh and eighth graders and kind of wondering why does it only go till sixth grade? So if you want okay. to take to address those. Thank you. Very good. Uh, ORF has not been studied as a measure to my understanding. There may be some studies, but I have not seen ORF applied before the before early first grade. Our norms, and you may have noted, start in the middle of first grade because what we found in our first two studies is that early first grade ORF measures are all over the place. They were too inconsistent for us to get a good measure. So we're really, I think it's it's uh, that the commercial, uh, the folks that developed commercially available ORFs are on the right track by in the early levels of kindergarten and early first grade doing letter naming fluency, letter sound fluency, nonsense word fluency. That makes more sense to me. Of course, having said that, there are kids who walk in the door on the first day of kindergarten reading text. Um, and for those kids, I think that you could probably safely use end of first grade. I mean, if they're reading solidly like a first grader, um, you, can, you can do that. Um, the reason our most current uh, norms only go up for sixth grade, that's a long, sad story. Pull out the violins. Um, we tried very, very, very hard to get access to the scores of older students and we um, we finally gave up. We were not allowed. It is an interesting time to be a researcher <laughs> uh, in the world where people are rightfully so very, very protective of data. We just didn't have access to that. However, our second study in 2006, we did go up through eighth grade and you can, and the, and the actual, the norms didn't change that much. We're not going to do another study five years from now um, because those two scores, those two charts are almost in, in most ways nearly identical. So the stability, especially around the 50th percentile, you can just trust that. And if you look at the scores from fifth grade and sixth grade and on to seventh grade and eighth grade at the 50th percentile, they're almost always right at 150 words correct per minute. So that's kind of becomes the threshold number and that um, uh, mirrors work that Tim Rosinski has done with high school and college students that of course there are readers above 150 but we're looking for that minimum um, for those of you who work with older students, uh, 100, uh, 150 is what you're looking for. That was actually one question that one of our listeners had was, do things tend to kind of plateau at a certain point? They do. So but what's they, they happening, do. yes, but yeah. what's happening, if you think about it, and I've had this conversation with Tim Shanahan over, over many years, because he, he was very concerned that the Common Core State Standards only talked about fluency through fifth grade. And he said, that's, that's seriously mistaken because fluency continues to develop. Fluency, now we can talk about this in a very sophisticated way. Fluency continues to develop, rate does not, mm -hmm. okay? Rate plateaus at 150 approximately. Fluency skills, the underlying skills, because if you can read fifth grade text at 150, and you can read eighth grade text at 150, your skills have grown. Your fluency, the underlying uh, mechanics have improved tremendously. You're maintaining a rate that's optimal for comprehension, mirrors spoken language. You're not reading faster, 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 faster. That's not fluency, we know that. But fluency does continue to, to grow. Um, we don't know exactly when fluency levels off, but it's probably um, well into high school and college um, where a good reader is still truly developing their underlying fluency skills. 
we'd had a couple of questions that were related. And I think that these types of questions come up in schools where they're making a shift from balanced literacy to more of a structured literacy approach. Yes. And um, so they're wondering like, well, I get it that we need, we're gonna assess fluency based on um, grade level text, but what is grade level text? How do I define it? And how do I talk to people at my school about why, what grade level text is not and how to get them away from the idea of the, the texts that are included in the benchmark assessment system or Fountas of Bunnell, because when they hear grade mm -hmm. level text, that's immediately where they go to. So do you have anything that, any guidance you could give us about what grade level text really means? Um, it's a wonderful question. And uh, one of uh, the work that Fontes and Pinnell and others did was to attempt mistakenly and without evidence, attempt to do that idea of, of putting levels on text that that implied some kind of precision that A is different than B and B is different from C. And uh, subsequent people came in and just said, you know, good try, uh, but no, there's no difference between those, those levels. They just, it, it's just false and uh, mistaken. And it's, you know, uh, just wishful, wishful thinking. Now though, there is difference in text. We all can see it. There's certainly, there's not difference between B and C and, and B and D, but there is difference between early first grade text and end of third grade text. There is difference, and, and but we can't measure it in finely grained. There's no way people have tried for a year, way before Fontes and Pinnell. People had readability formulas and all kinds of things trying to get precision about it. We don't have precision about it. There is no universal definition of third grade text. However, what we have done is some general understandings about length and complexity, number of, of multisyllable words, those kinds of things. And we have a general sense of what we expect kids to read at the beginning of first grade and the end of first grade. We can divide first grade into a couple of, a couple of pretty accurate groups. Um, second grade, we might also do that early second grade and late second grade. Once we get past that, we have third grade-ish, which ranges in difficulty and length, but fourth grade, fifth grade, they are general ranges. It is not accurate or scientific at all to be talking about grade levels. Um, uh, I have a whole presentation of, about that, how we, need, we really need to move away from, from grade level, but we do need ways to talk to each other about, uh, and to talk to parents and to talk to children. Um, and the way I'm recommending that is uh, that we uh, think about the skills that students should have at these various levels. And to a certain, so we're we can be talking about by second grade, these are the skills that should have been developed. Uh, your child has developed all those skills. So we call her a fluent second grade reader. Your child has not yet developed these skills. And here's what we're doing to help her develop those skills. Um, so there's some general consensus about these levels. So when you're using something like FastBridge or AmesWeb or EasyCBM, and they say, this is a third grade passage, you can pretty much trust. And if you look at samples across those passages, if you looked at a AmesWeb third grade passage or a Dibbles third grade passage, they're in the ballpark. And that's as close as it gets. It is not scientifically precise it never will be any yeah so we've got about two minutes left i i still have a few more questions here i think you addressed this pretty early on um tonight but you were talking about the um the hasbrook tyndall norms and how you know you look if you're below the 50th percentile um, you have you have something that you need to address and somebody was saying they use FastBridge which has their at-risk um, trigger is 40 40th percentile. And, um, you know, so how, how do you compare those two things? And I, I, I believe I heard you say that if you're using a specific assessment system, stick with their, what they suggest for their benchmarks. 
I think that's true. When I have looked at the uh, um, the technical manuals, um, geeky person that I am, am I'm going to if I'm going to use an assessment, I want to know what went into the development of the assessment. How, who was their norms group? How, who did they assess to create those norms? Um, uh, uh, and and they vary. Uh, there is a difference between FastBridge and EasyCBM and AmesWeb and those kind of things. But if they've done their due diligence, they've created thoughtfully uh, a rationale around where they draw those lines. And um, so I generally think that they're going to put you in the ballpark. And again, this is not as, as much a fan of ORF as I am and words correct for a minute. Remember I said there's a range around all of those numbers. It is not, it's not, that's one, one way that words correct for a minute is very different than a thermometer. A thermometer is very, very precise. An ORF is not precise, but um, it's a wonderful tool. Uh, we just have to be willing to do some interpretation. So my general suggestion, um, would be, yes, use the norms and the guidelines for benchmarks that come with the program, you're, the assessment tool that you're using. And if you care to, you can also compare that to Hasbrook Tyndall. You can use our norms as more of a generic second opinion um, on those assessments. Thanks. Um, for those of you who want a certificate of attendance, I have posted it in the chat. So make sure that you uh, click on that link so that you don't lose it. And I just want to um, get one more question in. This was the first question of the evening. <laughs> I promised I would ask it. Uh, when you're talking about accuracy, are you talking only about cor correct pronunciation or are you talking about being able to understand the meaning of the word? Mm. We try to separate out for consistency in order to have an assessment that we would all, if we were all trained on the assessment, everybody here tonight, I see 101 participants. Uh, so that's 100 plus me. If all of us were trained to give an assessment, we want it to be as reliable. We always know an assessment needs to have reliability and validity and the foundation is reliability. We give it consistently. We trust the results. One way to increase the reliability of an assessment is to have very narrow ways to decide whether a, set, a, a word or whether something's right or not, or not. We don't want to interpret a lot. So generally when we're training for an assessment like words correct per minute, a CBM assessment, we're very strict that the word has to be exactly as written on the page. They have to say it that way. Now we take in consideration dialect and um, articulation issues and those kinds of things. If the student is weeding about wabbits and that's the way this little second grader isn't quite articulating their R's, then the wabbit is wanting is perfectly correct for, the, for that child. But if they say the word the rabbit is, uh, or the, uh, let me think of a word here, the, the, the tables, the tables were all lined up and the student says table. And you didn't hear that S, that word would be wrong. So we're not, or uh, a more classic one um, is that uh, they, the student, uh, the child uh, saw, uh, the child went to ride the horse and they say pony instead of horse, that's an error. Um, we, can make, we can make a notation. We can think about the fact that, okay, they did a, a meaning substitute. So, you know, what's that all about? But it's wrong in terms of how we score it for accuracy. It has to be exactly the word that makes sense in the context uh, for that student and uh, uh, discounting dialect and, um, and articulation issues. Thank you. Uh, we've reached our time limit. I just want to give a big thank you to Jan for sharing all her knowledge and all of her experience tonight. It's, I know it's just, there've been a lot of very positive comments in the chat. Um, so we really appreciate you. I want to thank our um, co-hosting chapters for rounding up. I 
the 800 people on the registration list. And the, I think at one point we had 140 online tonight. So thank you. Thank you to Shonda for riding shotgun with me and, and checking out the everything that was in the chat and the, and the questions and so forth. And, and biggest thank you to all of you for tuning in and continuing your learning and for everything that you do to raise, build strong readers every day. And so we really, we appreciate all your efforts. And with that, I think we would just um, say, stay in touch with all our chapters. Um, you can find out about virtual events that we do, in-person events, uh, it, so many things going on. And so stay in touch with your Reading League chapters. That would be greatly appreciated. And with that, I just wanna wish everyone a great evening. Thank See you, you later. Thanks, Chandra. Goodbye, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.